Welcome to 108 South Jackson Street in Janesville, Wisconsin. This is the home of the Janesville Art League, and this is where we have our permanent collection. In 1894, they actually formed the Janesville Art League, and they started meeting as a group. They met in, different, in people's homes, they met at different businesses, and they met at the library. During this period of time, they had started to accumulate several different pieces of art, and it became apparent that they really needed a gallery in which to hang it. Then they started thinking about how to build a gallery and where they were going to build it. At that point, Mr. George Parker and his wife stepped forward and they offered $10,000 to start the process. At that point, a Mrs. McLoon offered and donated this land that this building now sits on. This was built about 1928 and the art lead moved in and they, hang, they hung their permanent art collection in the upstairs gallery. From here, they made connections with the Art League in Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, which was reaching out to these smaller communities and encouraging them to form art leagues and art groups. And they were more than willing to send out people to speak along with exhibits to show. And that's how we became more involved with the Art Leagues in the Art Institute of Chicago and the other artists that came there to pursue their art. Whether they taught at the Art Institute of Chicago, they may have also opened their own studios in Chicago. And they were more than willing to come back here and talk to us about what they were doing. And that's how we started our art collection, because they would buy a piece at a time. There was a lot of uh, women here. When the first group that brought these artists together and brought the Janesville Art League together, that had a vision. And looking through the files and the archives, I think they decided that they really wanted to form a, a the community and that they wanted to have an influence on the arts here in Janesville. And they had a vision to do this and they moved forward. They were very independent women and this was a way for them to establish their own individuality. About three years ago we started on the conservation restoration of our oil paintings and we have been working with Barry Bauman for the last three years to accomplish that. If it hadn't been for Barry and his generous offer, we would not have been able to afford to complete this, this process or this project. Uh, Barry worked for the Art Institute of Chicago for many years as a, a conservation person for their oils. So he comes highly recommended. He's a wonderful pe person to, to work for and we've thoroughly enjoyed that relationship. He retired from the Art Institute of Chicago and formed his own company. He was the first conservation person nationally to offer his services free of charge. So he donates his labor, and it was up to us to come up with the money for the materials for the restoration conservation project, which we have done. And many of our members step forward. Many of the people in the community step forward. And again, I think this is because we have a very valuable art collection here, and there's also a connection. Several of the members can remember how it started, and they have connections with the people that were maybe the first members of the Janesville Art League. So we also have been working with the Wright Museum at Beloit College, and Joy Beckman, who's just been a great support and has so much information that we need and can use. And thanks to her, we've been working with two different interns from the Wright Museum to document and get all our um, information into a computer. From there, we'll go ahead and hopefully we'll put together a catalog. So when people come into our gallery and they look at these wonderful paintings, they will know what they're looking at, when it was purchased, and, uh, and about the, the artists who um, are pretty magnificent and went on to do some very, very great work in um, Europe and in Chicago and in New York. 
So at this time, I think it would be a good time to start with uh, one of the first pieces that the Art League collected. This is called Dawn in Labor, and it was made by Helen Mears. This was actually shown in the Chicago World Fair in 1893. This piece also was in competition in Madison to be placed at the top of the state capitol. That didn't happen, and of course she was very, very sad about that. She was a marvelous woman and really was uh, a leader in women and in, in, in the arts. Um, she was born in Oshkosh, and if I'm correct, they still give out scholarships in her name. So this is a very significant piece. There was seven of them made. One is in Washington, D.C., and we have one, and I believe one is in Oshkosh. And we're, we're quite certain the rest of them are owned um, by private uh, families. But I wanted to start with this because it certainly um, showed that women were taking a step forward and starting to become very, very influential in the art world um, as individuals. When we first started our restoration project with our oils, I just wanted to explain just a little bit. They had been in uh, buildings that were not temperature controlled so that the canvases were sagging and in some, some pictures they were tearing. They were covered with coal dust and dirt and varnish that was turning yellow and cracking. So um, once we started this project with Barry Bowman and they came back, it was like they had just gone through a bath. They're beautiful and they're vibrant again. This particular oil was done by Edward Timmons. And this is so significant for us because he was with the Art Institute. He was in Chicago, but he was born and raised here in Janesville. In fact, he lived on Jackson Street. He lived on North Jackson Street, and his cousins lived on South Jackson Street. And there's many, many art articles from the Janesville Gazette because he never lost contact with us here. He came back many, many times. He painted many portraits here in Janesville as well as in Chicago. He, in fact, some of the portraits that he painted in Chicago were of those that were well known in society there. The one just above it is called Lake Geneva. That was painted off the porch of a JAL member in Lake Geneva. In fact, he was on her dock. And he gave this to the Janesville Art League in honor of Mr. Parker and Mrs. Parker, who had done so much to build our building. Both of these have been restored. They've gone through the conservation project or process. And this one in particular was totally gray. It looked like there was a huge storm cloud over it. And you can see how vibrant and how beautiful it is since, um, it, since it's come back from um, Barry Bowman's studio. Although this isn't an oil, I wanted to just take a few minutes to comment on this particular watercolor. It's called The Forest of Fountain Blue. And as I said, it was the first painting that the Janesville Art League purchased. There's a story that goes with this. At this point in time, the ladies were still meeting at the old library upstairs, and they got into quite a big argument about where this was going to hang. Should they hang it downstairs where it could be enjoyed and viewed by anyone that came into the library, or should they hang it upstairs where their meeting was? And they got into such a dispute about this, uh, Reverend Dennison was called in to arbitrate and to settle the argument. Not sure which people were on which side, but this painting did stay upstairs and was not seen until they moved into this building. I wanted to include these two paintings, the bottom one being uh, lilies at Lincoln Park, and this was done by Ella Tanberg. She was our first president of the Janesville Art League and also one of the founders. This particular piece has not been through the conservation process at this point, and so you'll notice how dark it is, and it's beginning to sag, and it's the, the varnish is um, yellowing on it. But if you look at the one just above it, that has gone through the conservation process, and we expect Mr. Mrs. Tanberg's oil painting to look the same. The one that is above is called this um, Black Hills in back of uh, 
Santa Barbara, and it was done by Mrs. Pemmer. She was also a president of the Janesville Art League and also one of the founders. Before we move on to the next oil painting, I just wanted to bring this uh, to your attention. This was the first two pieces of art that was given to the Janesville Art League by the Edgerton Pottery. These two pieces were also made by Helen Mears, and we talked about her when we first started filming. These pieces were sold at Tiffany's in New York and also at Marshall Fields in Chicago. And they're still very, very beautiful, beautiful pieces. The painting that you're looking at right now is called Planting Popcorn, and the artist was Adam Emery Albright. Uh, the Janesville Art League purchased that in about 1922 when he actually came to Janesville and he had an exhibit in the library hall. The two children you see in that painting is his twin sons. All three of them went on to, to Chicago and were very successful artists at that point. He actually was born and raised in Monroe, Wisconsin. And as you can see that he's using kind of darker shades during this period of his painting. Once he showed or was a part of the art exhibit at the World's Fair, uh, critics said that he lightened up a bit and some of his paintings became more vibrant. But we're very, very proud that we have this piece. He was one of the artists that then traveled west at some point in his life and settled in Brown County in California, and that became a colony of artists there that became very well known. I just briefly wanted to mention the portrait below pan, uh, planting popcorn. We did not know who did this. The experts that had looked at this particular portrait said it was very well done, and whoever had painted it uh, was very, very skilled. It was given to us by a Miss Reddy. When we sent it in to have it uh, restored and Barry Bauman took it apart, we had always thought it was an American artist, uh, only to find out that the original stamp on the back of this portrait was actually an English stamp. This was torn in like two different places when we sent it in. Again, it was covered with coal dust so you couldn't see the vibrant colors or the beautiful blue stones of her earrings. And I just wanted you to take a quick look at that because it's one of the most beautiful paintings that we have here in our collection. The next two oil paintings that we're going to be looking at was painted by Susan St. John's. And through this, I have mentioned many times about the connections. And this is one of the most important ones. Susan came from Ireland with her parents, and her first lessons was from her father, who was also a portrait painter. Susan painted this one first, and it's called The Mexican Flower Girl. The one above it is called A Greaser Bell. Susan actually was in Janesville, and she met her husband here before moving on to Chicago. From Chicago, she went to Spain, where she painted a lot of the dignitaries over there, and it was done in the ex-queen's bedrooms and living areas. She was very well known as a portrait painter in Chicago as well. The connection here is she wanted her pieces to come back to the areas that she had been in and she had painted in. With that said, her son, John, was ready to bring the flower girl to us when he took, took it into Mr. Timmons to have it framed and cleaned and touched up a bit. And of course, Mr. Timmons was still very well connected to Janesville and suggested that because this art league was growing, that it already had some very significant pieces that maybe he would like to give us another piece of Susan's work. And that's how we um, came uh, to own a greaser bell. And these are absolutely beautiful. Susan used the same model for both of these pieces, which makes them even more so significant to us. This piece is our flagship piece, and it was painted by Edgar Payne. He was an American artist. It's a very significant piece. 
It was purchased about 1922. He was putting a lot of his paintings into storage at that time. Because of the people in the Art League here in Janesville that had traveled to California and were a part of the art uh, groups in that state, they were able to contact him and purchase this piece. In fact, one of our members, whose name is Kay Jelenic, went to Minnesota, met with his daughter, who taught anthropology there, the University of Minnesota. I wanted to point out that before this painting was restored, we knew that this was water here, but we saw none of the reflections. None of the greens here along the bottom were visible. The snow up here looked like Wisconsin looks in about February. It was gray and very, very dirty. The whole top part where the sky shows was again, um, it looked like there was a storm coming in. It was very gray and very dull. And you can see what great work and how beautiful this painting was really meant to be. This is the last oil painting that we'll be seeing today. And this is very, very significant, not only to the Art League, but in, in kind of emphasizing again how important the connection was with many different people and organizations um, to the Art League and how we have accumulated these paintings. This was, is called Reflections and it was done by Lawton Parker. He was the very first art director at um, Beloit College. Barry Ballman, who is doing the conservation work on our paintings, went to school there. He had a professor there by the name of Williams, and because of his influence, that's why Barry went on and became part of the Art Institute and their conservation program. In addition to that, we had a, a Janesville Art League president, Mary Lou Williams, who also worked at Milton College in art and in Beloit College. This was one of the first paintings, in fact, the first painting that we had done. And we did that in the memory of our late president, Marilyn Keating. The oils in our collection represent like half of our whole permanent collection that we have here in our gallery. In addition, we have lithographs, etchings, watercolors, and an additional collection on printmaking. This is uh, an original lithograph that is hand colored with watercolor, and uh, this is the most detailed piece that I ever did, and it was meant as the the piece that contains all of the people and companies and things like that that uh, helped us to make the move from Chicago. I moved here from Chicago in 89 because my husband grew up here in, in Janesville and uh, his family still lives here. He was a master printer who studied in, uh, at UW and so we had a wonderful, wonderful partnership for quite a while and he, he died four years ago. So I think my lithographic history is over. But all of the tiny little strokes in here also contain names and scriptures and the names of companies. And I remember I had um, one day the UPS man came in and I told him his name was in here. And I asked, uh, uh, asked him if he could find it. And of course, he didn't have a magnifier. And I'd done it with a magnifier, so he he finally found it. But it was a uh, Trepp's Bait Shop. Someone, I remember I was at an art show and someone said, wait a minute, I see Trepp's Bait Shop. And that's from Edgerton. So it's still in Rock County, but a little farther away. So uh, the Janesville Art League uh, was a very important part of our life. Although we traveled and were very, very busy, it was very hard to uh, attend all of the events. But it was uh, the, the central place that art was uh, well, that art was either done through or shown through here in Janesville. And because my husband had been here since he was six, he had a lot of the same people in his life as adults who were alums with him. And so we would go to reunions. It was really, really very nice. But this was the, I consider it my, my masterwork. And, uh, 
I, each one is different because it's hand colored with watercolor, but essentially it's the same. And I know that I've had people ask what kind of trees these were, and I say, well, I, I don't know. I didn't remember to go past again. And of course, they're imaginary, so I have no idea. Uh, I, I'll say they're apple trees. Maybe that's, maybe that's. I was so pleased when uh, one of these pieces was put into the collection here because it made me feel even more a part of the area because I, I didn't grow up here. And I was 45 when I moved here and had my first backyard. This was my kind of art as a way of getting away from my life in the city. And uh, by the time I did this piece, I thought I would be doing work from wa walking out in the fields that we had. And I still just looked through windows and imagined what it was I was doing. And I guess it'll always be that way. So, so this isn't a real place and nothing is real and I don't work from photographs, it's just, uh, I'm very observant and the fine detail really, uh, if it convinces me it's a place I would rather be, it will convince someone else, by the way, it was not ever intended to be, but it's just, it's just worked very wonderfully. And I'm so glad that this hangs here in this, uh, in this wonderful gallery here for the Art League. This is one of the pieces that was commissioned for the Wisconsin Sesquicentennial. And this is the first etching that I've done in collaboration with somebody. And I drew the black part on a glass plate, which I'd never done before. And they used a uh, shining light through the glass plate to put the image on the first copper plate. And then all the other colors are printed colors with multiple plates. So uh, this was a big learning experience that I wanted to try very much. So even though I knew it was going to take an incredible amount of time and I wouldn't have, um, wouldn't have a lot of prints like you do when you're spending time uh, with something that will be a large edition, it was still just a wonderful thing to, to learn. And I worked with Andrew Balkan on that in Madison. And one of the really neat things was to see how the project came together because mine took so long to make and I liked to get away from home base where things were busy and the phone would be ringing and people would be asking questions. I would spend a lot of time at the studio and that's where many of the other artists doing the, the project came through. And a lot of these pieces, I do believe the addition was 125, um, and most of the pieces were uh, bought by corporations or museums or uh, I, like libraries, different places like that to be able to have on display as uh, the Wisconsin Sesquicentennial portfolio. And uh, one of them, is now also in the Smithsonian. So that is very, very special. So um, I, I just love living in a piece like that as I'm doing it. And one of the things that, uh, about this one that I particularly remember was that I was starting to draw the pump and my husband said, you're drawing a kitchen pump. And I wasn't sure what he meant, but it was the middle of winter. and. There was a blizzard going. And he said, I know where there's the right kind of pump and I'm going to go out and, and uh, take some pictures. And so he drove out into rural Fulton and uh, shown the lights of the Suburban on the, on the pump and took pictures for me. So most of the time I have no reference, but in this case, I had to make the pump larger. And uh, one of the other things I did, I believe that in that year that, that uh, they were the debate of having a hunting season for morning doves uh, was about to be ended. And so somewhere in this tree, I have a morning dove. One of my favorite little things is that there's a, a little cat, well, it's a big cat, looking at what I believe is a, is a ground squirrel under this, under this log. So it's on its haunches. And those are the little stories that I tell myself as I work on these. That, uh, I think about what this girl is thinking in the, uh, she's picking tomatoes or 
what the farm was thinking between his, his rows. So this was a wonderful project to have done and I was very honored to have been asked and the Art League is just right on top there to have purchased one of the, one of the series and uh, it, it's just a, a blessing that it's here. The pieces are beautiful, very varied and fortunately one of mine is in here too. So, so I'm a little bit of a tie for Janesville. Well, we're now looking at the Sesquicentennial portfolio, which is a wonderful portfolio of the work of 15 artists who are some of the most famous and very often internationally famous um, uh, etchers and so on in the world uh, with national and international reputations, and certainly all of them with ties to Wisconsin. The, um, uh, the whole idea uh, is rather unique, I understand, that no other state than Wisconsin, and certainly if, if so since, uh, this is the only one that uh, uh, has commissioned a portfolio of artworks to celebrate the 150th birthday of our state. The uh, work actually is somewhat the brainchild of one of the members of the Sesquicentennial Commission, whose name is David Prosser, Justice David Prosser now, and uh, who is an avid uh, art collector in his own right, who had a self-taught, by the way, and who had approached the gallery of Andrew Balkan, uh, which was then on Park Street, and realized that this is an unusual form of production and um, an artist himself who could produce um, and get together and choose the artists that are part of the uh, collection. The, they're being held in the, um, are displayed in the Eleanor Mills Gallery. Uh, she was one of the most devoted members and past presidents and life members of the Janesville Art League and we are very, very glad to have had her presence before us. Uh, the first work we are talking about of the 15 is the oldest member and certainly internationally known, John Wilde of Evansville, one of the three Rock County artists who are part of the collection. Uh, we've all, we're also talking with the, of the work of Susan Hunt Volkowitz and then Munio Makuchi too. Are the who's uh, one of the works is actually um, on loan to Senator Tim Collins' office in the state capitol. John Willie was the oldest member, uh, having been born in 1919, and having been a marvelous teacher and artist in his own right, uh, a, an unusual surrealist. Um, he is doing a more straight, though slightly witty, uh, representation of 75 artists 75 in 150 years. And at the very forefront, he sticks who would have strode into the picture anyway for Lloyd Wright. And uh, some of his friends, Warrington Colescott, who was also into the collection, uh, John Stuart Curry, who was our first artist in residence uh, of Wisconsin, a great idea and Aaron Bora, who was the second, and many other artists, um, um, uh, as you can see, throughout the work. Somehow, as an older, older artist and celebrating 150 years, his muse is not the classical younger or ageless person we might see in the Ed Paschke coming up, but um, instead slightly aged but ageless and throwing 
roses, rose petals, which were hand colored by John Wilby. Um, she presides over everything very gently. One of the artists who I believe had studied in Madison, but what has made his reputation as a Chicago artist since, um, and has had a one-man show at the Louvre, like the uh, artist of the um, introductory panel, Bruce Nauman, Ed Paschke uh, has done instead a classical figure, a little unlike the Wilby, she looks very classical because at that time, uh, uh, Paschke was at the Louvre and had been doing a show about variations on the Venus de Milo, one of the most famous sculptures uh, of the classical period that happens to be in the Louvre. Now, if you look at a picture of the Venus de Milo, she may have a good classical face, timeless, and because time has gone by, her eyes are, <laughs> the paint is gone from them. And uh, so, in fact, by now she is covered with a very 19th century fabric that looks like a wallpaper from Wisconsin. And uh, her, the headdress of the original is not like this. This is more like the classical headdress of, say, a victory figure, a taiki. Um, and and uh, it might have references also, although it doesn't look like it, to forward, which is on top of the, with the Madison State Capitol. So Paschke does make interesting uh, references and his subjects uh, slide a little bit off what is the, considered the usual. But as a Chicago artist, um, uh, he is very, very well known. Quintessential and a well, well internationally known Wisconsinite, Warrington Cole Scott, who has done Sunday service. <laughs> he is very often tongue in cheek, and um, uh, even another work, an etching by his in the uh, main gallery, uh, which is from the Dillinger series. Uh, as it were, does a sporting type rendition of the Northern Wisconsin and Chicago interconnection. Um, uh, actually, it, it was probably Warrington Colescott, I am thinking, and, and uh, say a historian called Hub, with his last name, Art Hub, who seemed to have coined the, the phrase a gentle mafia, which kind of does some justice, shall we say, to the immense explosion of the graphic arts and especially printmaking in uh, Wisconsin right after World War II, uh, when <laughs> the art department went from being sort of a subset of the education department and his first artist, like Sessler, whom we have in the uh, gallery, um, uh, uh, being hired to, to uh, teach printmaking, and was in a quonset hut. If any of you have seen old pictures and remember it, uh, the department has grown through all kinds of, of printmaking, original printmaking, uh, with um, actually Warrington Colescott teaching, particularly etching, with John Wilde actually drawing, which, uh, which could be made, of course, into various uh, other media, the Packer game. <laughs> Warrington had never seen a Packer game, believe it or not, at our 150th birthday because he was a Badger fan. So he went up, I understand it was a Lions game, but oh, the <laughs> old rival was the Bears, so the Bears it became. And of course, we had to have the um, activity <laughs> before the game, too, a little tailgating and so on. 
and um, a right roaring good time is had by all. Another actually artist, this one who is taught at the University of Wisconsin and also is teaching now in Chicago at the Art Institute is Gladys Nilsson who <laughs> chose for her subject uh, a rather witty rendition of uh, early invention supposedly in Wisconsin of uh, the ice cream sundae and of the hamburger. And of course, we have the uh, ladies who are looking uh, in on the action at a picnic with others bouncing around with what I think are brats and um, naughty naughty ladies and naughty naughty swimmers and <laughs> um, uh, uh, sort of spoofing various Wisconsin pastimes. Then an artist who has been active also in California was one of the first to be uh, doing his etching for the series uh, showing a map of Wisconsin, uh, all kinds of other tongue-in-cheek sayings, and a skater which perhaps has morphed in the lower right-hand corner into an old codger. <laughs> Um, on his last legs if it were sweeping up. Well, obviously the title piece is by an artist who seems to have the most famous international reputation uh, who had gone to the University of Wisconsin and uh, uh, studied printmaking and is well known, in fact, art news around the turn of the millennium was calling him one of the 10 most famous artists in the world. His name is Bruce Nauman. Uh, he is now in New Mexico. And he has in his studio, evidently, a little sign that says, make me think. So <laughs> he's a conceptual artist. And uh, what he does is <laughs> do what looks like the lazy way out because an etching is going to make you write or print backwards because it flips when or the image flips when it is printed. And he took instead what is called dry point. He just scratched into these plates, these copper plates, and uh, even changed the name of the whole thing. Wisconsin, sesquicentennial, 150th project. So he changes things around in a way it simplifies, but if you look at the images backwards, it's perfectly nutty. But, but uh, that gives the title piece to the entire set, three separate graphics. The uh, more, say, Wisconsin image works include um, actually two works, one by a master of a very illusion-like and yet, yet um, photographically detailed etching, which is uh, developed from photographs that he was commissioned because he has done work of Milwaukee to choose a good situation, a good viewpoint, which happens to be using her sausage. And from there, he does this marvelously toned and detailed work um, uh, of Milwaukee. Uh, actually, the wife of Warrington Cole Scott who is Fran Myers, Francis Myers, was given the other uh, commission, as it were, subject, the others could all choose their own, and hers is Madison's Monona Terrace and Frank Lloyd Wright, where she actually uses um, Xerox-like images 
and um, otherwise it is a rendition of one of Wisconsin's and Madison's uh, favorite landmarks. Some of our, our favorite memories and anticipation may be visiting the North Woods, as is true of this very famous illustrator, um, Snow White and, um, and with the peach, somebody. Anyway, Nancy Echo Burkhart, uh, whose uh, husband's work we already have in our collection. Um, this Lords of Lake Horseshoe are her tribute not only to the North Woods, but to her grandson, who is wearing an unusual mask, who is also swimming in the pristine lake, and um, whose image is almost like a like an early Italian 15th century portrait. You'll notice how the lines get stronger and weaker as they go around her chin. And, and um, it is a lovely childhood image and memory. Another artist who actually grew up in, in the North, um, uh, in Merrill, Wisconsin, is Tom Utek, who uses evidently almost random words of, um, I'm not sure whether it is the Chippewa Ojibwe or not, in his language of, of Ninda Andaki is the title of the work, which is almost a magical early morning, evening, um, uh, dusk image of strange animals flying owls, wolves ready to howl, and, and sort of the mystery and magic of the North Woods that I think we really can enjoy. A subject that doesn't seem so obviously part of Wisconsin is done by one of the youngest artists, um, uh, Fred Stonehouse, actually uh, was using strange masks in an open hand that um, are Mexican wrestlers, wrestlers masks, and inside their faces you'll see how kind of frightened they are. And indeed, their eyes, if you look at the colors, seem to change from gray to blue, it's very unsettling in a way, and yet the um, dichotomy, the difference, evidently also has to do with the role of Wisconsin Indians because in back uh, we see Mohican, Potawatomi, the Ho-Chunk, and um, the Lac de Flambeau names in very um, ochre-like tones uh, as part of the background. So we can draw our own conclusions. So finally we have two works that don't seem to be obviously uh, Wisconsin, but because they are abstractions, we can make our own connections perhaps. Michelle Grabner, who teaches uh, in Chicago and has taught in Madison, um, actually likes to use everyday objects. I guess what? What is it? The colors are so subtle. Have you ever looked at a screen, just the screen door in your house as the light hits it and how the colors change? very subtly, and um, they may have changed in the work as well. Anyway, um, the, the, uh, what we used to have called op art is the variations that come from looking at this screen and where she has manipulated the colors so that we can add to our imaginations. Finally, because he was the last to work on the edition. Once he had, as it were, shepherded the others with his expert printers. Um, uh, Andrew Balkan, uh, who, by the way, had spent a freshman year at Milton College, 
um, uh, and went on to study and to do advanced degrees in philosophy and in art at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, has given us an abstraction, a rather concrete abstraction of, of, of um, almost vortex-like materials that seem to go around a center um, uh, which could be almost like an Indian shield and perhaps is not. Um, as a philosopher then, his, um, and I'll quote this one uh, from, their, from his own catalog, Andrew Balkan's imagery emerges to reflect an ongoing dialectic, stepping out from the traditions of non-objective art as influenced by artists like Kandinsky, Malevich, and Mondrian, and from Balkan's in-depth studies in late 19th and early 20th century philosophies. So the tensions created between the patterns, which by the way are very intricate, this was very difficult to print um, on the presses, uh, and the beauty of the forms in their abstract sense gives us a lot of pleasure, perhaps not as obviously Wisconsin-based, but certainly from the heart and mind, Wisconsin. In closing, thank you all. I hope you enjoy this presentation. We're very proud of our collection and the oils that we have here. I would hope that you would take the time sometime to stop by the Women's Club and view it. We're open Monday through Thursday from 9 to 1. We're, we are closed on Friday, however. I want to thank you and I hope you enjoy this presentation.